Yeah, all right. Uh, first of all, <coughs> thank you very much, Bob, for having a chat with us. And um, thank you to the Australian BMX Museum for helping us out today. Very good. Um, just like to know a little bit about your background. So um, first of all, what was your first, very first BMX experience that you remember? My very first BMX experience. Um, let me think what that might have been. I'm thinking here. I mean, I think, it, well, actually, my first BMX experience came about, it wasn't a BMX bike. It was a Schwinn Stingray. It's what we rode in America. And we made them into BMX bikes. But it wasn't called, we didn't call it, it wasn't known as a BMX bike yet. We just took our Schwinn Stingrays and put, um, heavy duty rims and spokes and knobby tires on them and pads and fake gas tanks that they had back then and uh, maybe motorcycle grips so it was kind of cool. Running number plates was important though. Again when you're 14 or 15 years old kind of looking like you had a motorcycle it was pretty important. Um, I was at that time you know again as a young teenage kid living in Southern California um, motocross was big and uh, you know where I lived there was tracks all over the place this is in the uh, in the 70s so there's I lived, grew up in San Diego and there's fields everywhere so having a dirt bike was really cool and uh, I didn't have one in the beginning I used to ride with friends and stuff like that but that was my mission was to get a to get a dirt bike my brother actually my brother Scott had a BMX bike. He had a proper BMX bike. It was a stroker, an old square tube stroker BMX bike. And um, he bought it, but he never really rode it. I ended up riding it most of the time. And uh, what I remember is I ended up riding it so much that I broke it. And when I broke the bike, my dad, uh, I had to cut a deal. It was, uh, you broke it, you need to buy it. So I ended up having to buy it from my brother, and that's how I got a BMX bike. So that I remember. But um, so that was kind of my early experiences with BMX bikes. So um, straight off the bat, were you into just um, jumping, um, freestyle sort of stuff, or did you start off racing? Um, in the beginning, you know, again, I think like every kid, you're the thrill seeker. You know, you were into jumping things, and it didn't matter what it was. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, you make jumps in the neighborhood. You could be on the pavement, on the sidewalk. You'd, you know, we have milk crates that we would use, and we'd put a board up on it, and you'd see how far you can fly. And all the neighbor kids would come out. And my sister Janice, her uh, her boyfriend John, him and I, we would ride together. And John was really a good rider. So we'd ride together all the time, and we'd set up jumps, and that's we, that's what we do. We get off of school, and then we ride every day for hours on end until basically mom calls you in for dinner. But um, yeah, and it, you know, the fun thing about riding back in those days was, uh, you know, you rode your bike to school. So you get out of the house, you'd bomb out of the house and all the way to school was a track. You knew which curbs to hit, you knew which berm to hit, you knew what uh, jump was in a certain field if you cut through it. So it was full on. Um, when did you start making race plates and why? So number plates, you know, making the number plates came about was an offshoot of now after I had a dirt bike. I had my, uh, I had a 100cc uh, XL100 Honda that was a street bike that my dad co-signed for me to get. He wouldn't let me get a proper dirt bike because he wanted me to be, have something practical. So I had that, uh, that XL100 for probably a month or two and I stripped it all down, took all the parts off, put number plates on it and that's what I used to commute to work through all the back country where I lived in San Diego. Later I got a 125 Honda Elsinore. So I got a real dirt bike. And uh, you know, again, looking at magazines like Motocross Action Magazine, which is from the States, um, all the factory riders, if you will, you know, they had really cool number plates. So um, it started kind of as an art project, you know, just not like an art project in that way, but just 
kind of creating something cool for our BMX bikes. Because prior to that, we used to just either run a pie plate or a round oval, excuse me, an oval number plate or a square number plate. And they were Preston Petty made them. They made motorcycle products. So those were the first, those were the first number plates. But uh, after seeing these really cool number plates in the um, motorcycle industry, I just kind of worked up a design which became this kind of classic design that came up on the handlebars and stuff like that. And uh, the name of the brand was called Factory Plates. So that's, I made one, I made uh, one for my sister's boyfriend, John, and one for myself. And we were racing the local BMX tracks. And we went to the track and uh, they were a hit. Kids were like, wow, where'd you get those? I said, well, we made them. And can you make me one? And again, age uh, 17 or whatever, you know, this little business was born. Then I got more enterprising. I, I made a flyer, um, went down to a little speedy print place. I made a little flyer. I laid it out and uh, I'm racing BMX bikes and uh, racing motos, excuse me. And then in between motos, I would go and pass out flyers to all the kids at the track, their parents. And uh, that started my started a little business. So um, <clears throat> what do you think of today's race plants? Um, I think they're okay. I think they're good. What do I think about them? I think they're okay. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot, there's, uh, I feel like I've inspired some of the new generation plates, to be honest with you. You know, um, 2011, 12, I kind of introduced what I was going to do with Iconics, the new brand I was working on. And, um, uh, I was a little zealous and kind of showed my hand before I was ready to release the product. So I, I feel like I kind of inspired a lot of the new shapes right now. Maybe that's being egotistical, but that's what I feel. And uh, I'd have to go back forensically and look what came out after. But uh, I did a plate for Nike in 2008 that was just purely a concept plate, but it was very modern and stuff like that. And then I did uh, later what was going to be the Iconics plate, and I made it in two awards that I did at some of the uh, uh, USA Cycling events. You know, uh, Connor Fields received, we made a CNC uh, aluminum plate, <laughs> which was the exact shape of the plate. So. Um, what was your favorite model Haro plate? Favorite model Haro plate? Um, I would say probably still the lightning bolt. And uh, I like the flow panels. I think those were pretty cool. Um, over the top, the, what was it, Tech Series plate? I can't remember what I even called them back then. <laughs> I think I was working really hard trying to make simple, really complex, you know, with the removable panels and plastic numbers and all that stuff. But again, it was a time that anything goes, you know? And we sold a lot of them and, uh, you know, they were cool for the time, but, uh, yeah, probably. Still think the the lightning bolt is probably the most iconic plate. You know. Which was the best selling of them all? Best selling number plate. <sighs> couldn't even tell you. I couldn't even tell you which one was the best one. I mean, because at the time when we were, you know, leading the charge selling number plates, you know, we had square ones and round ones and mini ones and um, tech series versions. So. You know, we weren't that sophisticated of a company that we tracked all that. We were just happy we were selling stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, as a business, we were trying to have different price points. You know, there's the high-end model and the mid and the low-end model. Um, how did Haro jump from being a plate <coughs> company to making bikes and race gear? So Haro didn't start out as Haro. Haro started out as um, Factory Plates was the name of the company when I first started. And factory plates was just an offshoot of if you were a factory rider, that was really cool. That was the top of the, you know, came out of motorcycling. If you were a factory rider, you rode for Honda or Yamaha or somebody like that. So I was influenced a lot by Moto. And um, so I thought that would be a cool name for my brand, factory. And I only made number plates. So, um, so that's where we started. It wasn't later until I was, uh, I got teamed up with, a guy named Dave Dash, who was the publisher from Skateboarder Magazine and Action Now Magazine. And uh, 
I became friends with those guys. And Dave, we were sitting at a restaurant one night and we were talking and, you know, um, Dave's a very optimistic guy and he says, you know what, you need to call your, your company something other than Factory Plates. And I was like, Factory Plates is a cool name. He's like, yeah, but that's, if you, are you only going to make number plates? He says, what do you think one day maybe you can make bikes? You can make this, you can make that, anything. And I'm like, bikes? What are you talking about? He says, why don't you use your last name? I go, Haro? I go, that doesn't sound like anything. He goes, just, that would be good. Use your last name on it. It doesn't say anything, and you can, you know, make anything you want. Factory plates, you got to make number plates. So Dave was the guy that inspired me to use my name. So... Um, at its peak, how many people did you employ at Haro? Um, well, it's bigger now, but when I had it, we were pretty lean and mean all the, you know, most of the time. Um, I'd say we had a, probably a staff of, I don't know, seven to 12 people. You know, a few guys in the warehouse, a few people in the front office, a couple salespeople. Um, yeah, it was a pretty small staff. You know, we had a small operation, but we, we did a lot. We got a lot of stuff done. Later, when I sold the company, you know, we merged with a company called West Coast Cycle, Cycles out of Los Angeles, and uh, they had a brand called Nishiki and Cycle Pro. Uh, Nishiki was a road bike line. Cycle Pro was uh, kind of an entry-level line, and then they had, a, they had uh, parts and accessories. So when I sold the company in 87, you know, it gave us um, it gave us the financial horsepower to expand expand the brand and really grow it because um, I had grown it basically from my parents' bedroom. I mean, excuse me, my bedroom <laughs> at my parents' house, and um, so that's you know you get you go so far kind of on your own you know your own energy and and uh, and money, and uh, it, it became apparent that you know we were a young company. We were we were on top of our game. We had the best riders. You know, uh, we had a lot of momentum. Um, we had, you know, customers that just love what we were doing. And um, so, by selling the company and merging with West Coast Cycles, it gave us significant horsepower to, you know, build the company up. And uh, you know, by doing the transaction, we tapped into I, I don't know what it was, 150 salespeople five different distribution uh, warehouses and, uh, you know, bigger credit lines. You know, they could buy product that, that we didn't have the, the money to buy. So we, if we ran out of cash, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they let us do a lot more. Um, are there any regrets to uh, selling up and, and walking away from Haro? No, I, I don't think, you know, I try not to be... I try not to be uh, regretful about anything. There's obviously things you would do different. You got to remember that I started this thing at, uh, I incorporated the business in 1978. I was probably all of 19 maybe. Uh, started a business by the time I was 20 years old, we were selling more than a million dollars a year just in number plates. And so, you know, jerseys and a few things, but number plates were the deal. Every kid needed a number plate on his bike. And um, so, you know, at a very young age, I had a, you know, I had a lot of success. And, uh, you know, when I sold the company, we were a little, probably about seven and a half million dollars a year. And then within a year of selling the company and merging with West Coast Cycles, we did almost $12 million. You know, this is in the 80s. So, uh, you know, a lot happened. A lot happened. And... Uh, you know, I said it before, you know, it's a little bit kind of like being in a, it was like being in a pop band, you know, it's just like this, you're young, you're making money, you've got fame in a little world, and uh, it was a really exciting time, really magical time, and, um, you know, I could see how artists can get in trouble, because, you know, it can be a bit, a bit addictive, you know, you've got this amazing success, and you're in publications, and you're getting interviews like you are now, and, uh, you know, you're making more money than you've ever made in your life. And uh, so it comes with a lot of responsibility. It didn't, it didn't come lightly. You know, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, my family didn't have any money. So growing up in that, you know, you're not really prepared for a lot of things that come from that. 
Um, what did you move on to after um, you walked away from Hara? <clears throat> So in 1993 was the end of my contract, and then I had a two-year non-compete. So I couldn't do anything in the bicycle business. So I packed up my stuff from the office. No one helped me. A friend of mine I was dating, her name is Nina, and her girlfriend, we came over and we moved my stuff out. And uh, it was kind of a tumultuous time in the business because, you know, when you when it's your baby and it has your name on it, it's your baby, you know? And uh, so, but your staff realizes that you, your contract's coming up. January 1, you're done. And you watched people that you hired and worked there for many years, you watched them realign themselves with the new management because they know where the check's gonna be signed. So as a young guy, that was kind of hurtful. You're like, dude, I hired you, you know? Um, so anyway, again, more life lessons, if you will. But uh, I packed up my stuff, <clears throat> and uh, a buddy of mine um, had a company called Jet Pilot. They did uh, watercraft stuff. They were right in my area, and they had a new warehouse, uh, kind of a creative warehouse, and they said, you want to rent some space from us? So I rented a little, I rented a, de I put a desk in the back, in the back of a warehouse, cold warehouse, kind of like uh, the bicycle was it warehouse? What are they called? Bicycle Works. Bic bicycle Works. About the same temperature, about 40 below. <laughs> we used to work in the shop with our, on our computers with gloves on. We, with, <laughs> it was fingerless gloves just because it was so cold and a space heater under, our, under the desk. But uh, I guess the long story to that is I segued from being in the bicycle business today, being the boss of horror bikes, tomorrow I've got to figure out what I want to do. So I took about six, eight months off and, you know, you party, you travel, you, you work out. I was really fit. You do all that kind of silly stuff. But I've always worked, so um, I was trying to think, I've got to do something. What do I want to do? So a buddy of mine was racing uh, go-karts, shifter carts with 125 motorcycle engines in them. So I, uh, I got into that. I thought it was really cool. I bought one, and, but they were pretty, pretty funky looking. And uh, so I got a wild idea, maybe I could start a little business there. So I, I segued from horror bikes and then I started a little company called Gearbox in the cart business. And um, I was making uh, apparel. I mean, had made driving suits and boots and gloves and rib protectors and neck, uh, neck restraints and body work and all kinds of stuff. So I got deep into that. I got into an ultra, I went from BMX, which is a niche market. I went into karting, which was ultra niche market. So I did that and uh, I did that for about five years. It was good, got me, I met a lot of people in the motorcycle industry and that kind of segued me into the motorcycle industry. And then I was doing uh, gearbox and uh, then I had a small agency. I picked up some clients and uh, one turned to two into four into 10 different clients or so in the motorcycle industry. And uh, yeah, I was deep into that. NASCAR took off in, uh, in, in America um, through karting. I met somebody in the automotive industry, liked what I was doing with my brand, with uh, Gearbox. And then Ren Speed, I started a kart company. And uh, I got teamed up with these guys, this uh, guy's uh, named Terry Bassett. Terry be uh, becomes my friend. He moves over to Penske Motorsports. Now I'm starting to do stuff with Penske Motorsports in, in America. They have top NASCAR team, top IndyCar team. You know, I'm riding that wave. So I start doing that and doing design, advertising um, bits for those guys. So, yeah, after, after horror bikes, it kind of got swept away in, in the whole motorsports world. I couldn't do anything in the bike business because I had a non-compete, and it was just as well. I needed a little break from the, uh, the bike business. Um, we've seen your return to the BMX scene more so probably over the last decade. What is it that's um, brought you back? <clears throat> so I think, you know, when I, when I got out of it in 93, that was a, that was a uh, not difficult, not challenging. It was just... It was, it was a challenge for me because I had to segue. I had to re reinvent myself. You gotta remember I was, you know, the owner of Horror Bikes. I was the uh, lead stunt guy on my own team, um, lead design guy on my own team. And, um, you know, when you have an agreement, 
today you're the boss, tomorrow you're not. And uh, so I had to, uh, you know, I, had to, I just needed a break. I needed a break, you know. And so I, I didn't go to BMX events on purpose. I just needed a break. Because the, the challenge of, you know, when you're Bob Harrow, and this sounds stupid, your name's on a bike. And even today, you know, when we're in the park talking to people, they, you know, they want to talk about, hey, I've, I've always had Haro's, I always love it, you know, and it's really nice, it's really sweet, but, um, you know, it's your old girlfriend. She's hot, but, you know, she's with somebody else now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, so, you know, for me, I just, you know, I just had to take some time off. So more recently, go back to your question, you know, I got hit up in 2007 from Mark Lumen. And Mark used to be with Spike and Andy back in the days of uh, Ride and Go magazine and BMX Action. So Lou hit me up and said, hey, how'd you like to work with Nike? Because it was one of his clients. It's, you know, anyone's ears perk up at that time. So BMX is going 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, BMX is going to the Olympics, first time ever. So um, Lou introduces me to the creative director for Nike 6.0. So his name is John Martin. John Martin is a wild Irish guy who's mad about BMX. He's like over the top. He's he's ultra fanboy, super cool guy, super passionate, and he's the boss. And he's got a budget. So I got uh, teamed up with, uh, you know, the Nike boys. You know, I don't know what they had. I've heard rumors they had like a million dollar budget to spend on BMX, but they were sponsoring you know, the Chinese team, the Japanese team, the U.S. team, and others. So they asked me if I would like to design the kit for the 2008 Olympics and other things, you know. So I got invited to do that, and I, you know, they, in their Nike way, you know, swoon and uh, they, uh, what's the right word? Court you, you know, I went up to Portland, and I met with them, and I met with the team, and, you know, put you up in a posh hotel, and... I went in my room and there's probably not even lying five thousand dollars worth of Nike gear on my on my bed. About fifteen pairs of sneakers in my size, all kinds of crazy ones. All kinds of gear. And I was like, holy cow, this is awesome. And uh, so that was a really cool ride to be on, you know. So when you ask about how I got that kind of re sparked me, you know, to kind of do something back in BMX. To be honest with you, at that point. I kind of had been detached because I was so busy doing my agency and I was really going to more motorcycle races and, and car events at that time. I wasn't doing much in the BMX thing. And, um, you know, I wasn't even following the old school BMX movement at all. You know, I just wasn't. And I didn't really have a social media presence. I, wasn't, I just wasn't doing anything with that. And um, <clears throat> so the Nike thing kind of was, it rekindled in a good way, kind of reintroducing me to BMX. And I have to say that at the time, I was a little concerned that, God, what am I gonna have in common with these guys? I'm like the old guy in BMX. They, they even wanna hang out with me? They're gonna to wanna to talk to me? So, uh, and it was quite to the contrary. You know, They were, I think, kind of stoked to see a little bit of their roots in the sport that they're in. So, so that was, that was the, kind of a bigger push. And then from that came the 2000, you know, 2012 Olympics happened, uh, you know, again, got teamed up with the Nike guys, um, worked with the USA Cycling Federation in America, Red Bull comes online, they're doing some special events at, uh, um, the, what is it, Miller Red Park. Bull, yeah, Mellow Park, the Red Bull Revolution, got teamed up with that, again, go back to the art, they liked my art, they wanted to use my art for the event, make a shirt, make it for graphics on the uh, starting hill, all this kind of stuff. So all these things kind of happened, and that kind of gave me a push. And, uh, and then I got a little deeper into the kind of the old school movement, if you will. You know, um, I got invited to events like I have for this one. It's cool. I like it. But for me as a design guy and a creative, I don't want to just do old stuff. I just, I just, it's cool, but it's, I like old cars, but I don't want to own one. I think they're all right. You know, I'd rather have something that, it's reliable, runs well, and looks cool too. But uh, I can appreciate it. But um, so 
you know the the old school thing I think is really cool. It's really it's really fun. It's your super date stamp though. You know everybody is kind of in this this moment in time, locked into this t moment in time. So so I think I guess fast forward to now. You know um, I figured you know I still have something I can contribute to BMX. So you know I started uh, working on kind of creating a new little brand, if you will. So I've been working on that. And I'm just kind of, it's really small, just kind of doing it the way I want to do it, making everything the way I want to do it. You know, how the shirts are, the hats, the jackets, the logos, the look, the feel. My trademark is born from BMX. That's my trademark. Um, the same with Iconics. You know, I'm working on Iconics. It hasn't dropped yet, but again, it's, it's to have some heritage, but not be old. I don't want to do old. I just... You know, I know I'm getting older, but I don't want to do old stuff. I still, I still want it to be kind of forward thinking. Um, get, talking about Iconics, um, mm -hmm. tell us a bit about the concept bike that you um, come up with <clears> recently. <throat> so Iconics was, um, again, just as a designer, just my response to, you know, contribute, continue to contribute to BMX. So coming up with a new brand. The name is funny. The name came about because people would say, oh, dude, you're an icon in the business. You're an icon in BMX and stuff like that. And I started kind of thinking about that. And uh, that's kind of where the name Iconics came from. And I didn't want to do like rad bike or something, something like that. It's not kind of not my style. I wanted something kind of like group one, you know, group one. What's group one mean? It sounds like it sounds like it's something, you know, and uh, so I wanted Iconics to have a little bit Kind of a kind of an elevated name, if you will, and uh, so that's that's what I started with, and then the logo that you see here on my hat that came about from an old photo of me from uh, that we did a photo shoot at the end of a photo shoot shot on top of a hill. It was again a hero shot, and uh, I thought, oh, that would be a cool logo, something different, you know. So I was just looking for something different. So again, you know, just. I just kind of want to do it the way I want to do it. If you like it, cool. And if you don't, that's okay too. So um, going back to the concept bike. Um, yep, sorry, I got off. No, time. that's all right. Um, the materials you played with, you, you used a lot of carbon um, yeah. and you come up with designs that um, would probably make people scratch their heads a little bit going back to a, a triple clamp style fork. And mm -hmm. um, just, just tell us a little bit more about the concept itself and, and why you went the direction you so, went. The bike you're speaking of is the, uh, we call it the SX1, the Supercross 1, and that was, carbon was coming onto the market at the time. I know it's, it's still there, it's prevalent now, but you know, I wanted to do a carbon bike, and uh, that's the sexy, fast, you know, material to use. So we came up with our own frame design, very swoopy looking, so that frame is a is a mix of carbon and then the chain stays on it, and the chain stay bottom bracket, it is all um, CNC uh, aluminum. So it's a bit of a modular kind of frame that we built. So that bike there was to be the kind of the show bike, concept bike. It's something to kind of rattle people, if you will, or maybe um, think about the car show. You go and you see some exotic car that's really kind of over the top. Kind of makes people go, oh, I don't know about that. But at the same time, you're kind of like, whoa, it's kind of cool too. So we, I wanted to do something like that. The triple clamp fork, um, again, I like Formula One cars. And I like, uh, you know, I thought it would be really neat to have the forks being blades, like a Formula One struts. So, and I thought that, again, I just kind of looked at uh, BMX racing as it is today. It's, uh, what is it? 34, 43 second sprint, whatever the number is, it's just flat out. You're not, it, it's not in the Harry Leary days. You're not out there having time to do a big X up over a jump. So really I thought of the bike as this is just purely a track bike. You're just gonna get on it, point and shoot, go really fast. You know, it'll still turn plenty. You get plenty of room to turn, but it's not for going out and doing dirt jumps. And I wanted something, I thought marketing wise, I wanted to do something that if you saw it on the line, on you know, you're like, what the hell's that? It was a bit of that, you know. I wanted to have something that was a little bit over the top. Yep. Um, you spoke a little bit about the BobHaro.com brand mm -hmm. um, about your t-shirts and hats. Um, where do you see that going over the next couple of years? Um, 
I see it evolving, you know, from where it is now. It'll have its foundation in BMX. It will have, uh, you know, my story, which I feel is kind of the foundation and kind of the legacy of the brand. But um, I want to I want to freshen it up with new riders, young riders, relevant riders, you know, that are in today's sport. It can be racing or freestyle. You know, I'm working with Vicky Gomez now. You know. Uh, 2016 uh, World Flatland Champion out of Spain, you know, super hot rider, I think he's 27, you know, fresh faced kid, you know. So collaborating with him, I'm helping him in a capacity of with his branding and merchandise. So again, I find a lot of athletes, you know, I feel fortunate that, you know, as an athlete, I had the ability to create, you know, so that's what I did for my own brand. I find a lot of times that athletes are really good at being an athlete, but all that other stuff they don't know how to do. So I've been trying to help a few people like that. So Vicky is the uh, one, Corbin was another, trying to help Corbin as well, Corbin Shira. Um And then I've just inked a deal here in the last uh, couple weeks with uh, Austin Keene. He's a pro uh, wakeboard and uh, skimboard world champion. So he's amazing, amazing guy. Uh, again, 27 year old, super rad looking guy, crazy Rasta hair. Ultra fit, you know, just he's the he's the man. He's on in the States, he's in on Ford commercials and stuff like that. Just he's just cool. So again, he's my first non uh, BMX guy. So I guess my plan my my plan with uh, you know the Bob Hart design brand is to have again foundation in BMX, but try to try to reach out a little, kind of branch out and and uh, maybe be a little bit of a lifestyle brand if you can. So it's all baby steps right now. It's still pretty small. But uh, I feel like, you know, it's kind of coming together. How do people access the product? Right now it's, uh, it's consumer direct. You just go to bobharrow.com and you can find it. So I'm working on deals where we'll have, you know, if I can get product made, you know, state, um, excuse me, in Europe or in Australia or other places, because the, right now shipping and the duties and everything else kill it. It's, it's difficult. So, um, so that's what I'm working on. Um, getting back to the sport of BMX, how do you think the X Games has affected the sport? So I have some, I have some, I don't know, strong opinion, but I think that X Games has been good for action sports. I think it's given uh, action sports a platform. I think it's give it, given it high visibility. I think, you know, you could ask anybody today, grandmothers or moms or dads that maybe aren't into sports, They've seen pro snowboarders or, or BMXers or moto guys. They've probably seen it. I think my negative for, uh, I feel for uh, X Games, it just feels like it's turned into a big huck jam at this point. I feel like it's, it's, it's just a show. You know, I don't, I think, you know, when I look at Mega Ramp, I mean, it's incredible to me, the guys that do it. But there's only a very small handful of, of guys that can do that. I don't know if it's good for maybe BMX overall because I, I think it's, it's, I don't know. I think our era of BMX was, you know, your mom and dad would sign off on it. They'd buy you a bike. They'd let you go out in the yard and you could build a ramp. Yeah, he's going to, he might break something, but, you know, he's not going to die, <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, it's probably, I guess it's been good for ESPN and great for ratings and stuff like that and, you know, but. I don't know if it's good for the sport. I don't know. That's just my feeling. Maybe I just sound like an old guy now, but I don't. I don't know if it's good to. I don't think. It, I don't feel like it's bringing in new people. Do you think um, BMX uh, freestyle at the Olympics is going to make a, a big change, or do you think they'll be pretty much along the same lines as the X Games? No, I think BMX freestyle in the Olympics. I think is different. I think that. Um, I feel like Flatland is making a pretty good, you know, strong not resurgence, it's been around, but it's becoming more and more popular. And again, I think it goes to accessibility, accessibility. It's easy, you don't need anything. You don't need to build a mega ramp. You don't need to have, build any ramps. You just find a flat area, you can go ride your bike and spend a lot of hours learning those crazy tricks, you know? Um, no, I think, I think that will be good. I think, again, it'll be a, a new, you know, put, again, a big platform for the sport in the world's eyes, you know, to begin be on stage in the Olympics is always 
it's always the uh, the big one when you tell people, you know, well, what's BMX? And you say, oh, you know, it's in the Olympics now. Oh, yeah, you know, I think I saw that, you know. So I think it'll help. Um, how do you think we could make BMX as popular as it was in the 80s? Get kids off their cell phones. Oh, I don't know, you know. I think there's a lot more distractions kids have nowadays than we did, you know. How we absorbed media back then was waiting by the post office, by the, the box out front to see when the magazine came in or go down to the newsstand, you know. I mean, I don't, you know, will it ever be as popular? I don't know, These this sport like skateboarding and other sports kind of ebb and flow, you know, new generations may accept it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know, it, it feels now like, uh, you know, again, I can only go back to my era and we, back in those days, like with Steve, we were all promoting BMX. We were all making ramps. We were all, you know, so many of us got sponsored by little bike shop teams and stuff like that. So we were all like these little promoters. We were all promoting BMX. And I don't, I don't think that's there anymore, you know? Um, so, I don't know, I don't have the silver bullet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you have a lot of history in Australia. What's your fondest memory? Well, her name was, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was so easy, dude. <laughs> um, my fondest memory. I thought you said memory. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think I'm getting punchy. Um, I think, you know, probably... I think probably when I lived in uh, in DY, hanging out, that was pretty cool. That was pre that was a pretty special time. Just got to you know again, I got picked up. I got to sleep in. I had my coffee and got picked up, and we took off in a in a truck with uh, ramps on it, and we went to department stores or wherever else they took me to shopping centers and stuff like that. And I did demos, and they were as basic and as raw as they get. I mean, it was some ramps we set up, we're in a mall, and we had a little boom box like PA system. And uh, here you're, you know, shoppers are walking by like, what the hell's going on? And you're doing demos. And the brand was called Rat Clothing. I don't know if you remember oh, yeah. that. Yeah, so Rat, yeah. So uh, yeah, here I'm rocking that shirt. And uh, <laughs> it was a, a new startup kind of, uh, Action sports line, if you will. So he's doing demos. So that was a that was a that was a pretty fun time. Um, yeah, just you know, going to going to events. You know, again, we were piggybacked on the BMX stuff that was going on here. Just going to events and riding and showing new kids what freestyle BMX was pretty darn cool. Yeah. Um, what is it that brings you out to Australia this time around? To hang out with Steve Cassip and jog my memory, <laughs> all the things I've forgotten. <laughs> no, um, I came out here for the uh, Hearst Bridge Show and Shine event, and uh, I didn't realize Glenn was going to have me on such a booked tour. He made it sound like, dude, you're going to hang out, you can relax, you can check out the city. It's going to be great. You know, got a light schedule on the sun, a Saturday, and then Sunday you just hang out. <laughs> yeah. he, you're he, here now, you're stuck. Yeah. So, yeah, he did a fine job. He should be a travel agent. <laughs> but, um, so now out for that and, you know, just get caught up with some of my pals uh, and make new ones. Um, uh, what's the biggest difference between the U.S. and Australia that you've found? Um, the biggest difference between Australia and America. Uh, you guys are on the other side of the road. <laughs> I, don't, um, I, don't, I don't know. It, it, um, I, I don't know. I think I've come here too many times. I'm comfortable, you know. I've even driven here. Um, <laughs> 
Some people I can't understand. Most I can, some people I, I can't understand. But uh, no, it's all good. I, I don't really have anything that pops out of my, out of my mind. I'm not really into um, hamburgers with an egg on it, though. <laughs> what on about pineapple? Top. A pineapple I can do. But uh, yeah, that one's a, we talk about it back home, like, what the hell? Why did we do that? <laughs> it's like an egg McMuffin with a hamburger. <laughs> Um, that's all for questions. Just uh, thank you very much for yeah, your time and thank you. um, uh, enjoy the rest of the trip. Thank you. There'll be more tonight. There'll be more war stories tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yep, thank you. What was your best memory? What was your best memory? <laughs>